Okay, uh, so today we're talking about uh, tree planting. So last week we covered tree improvement and then the different types of seedlings you can buy and how the nurseries grow them. And so this sort of builds on that. And so as we talk about tree planting, let's start with a group exercise. And this builds on what we did last week and I think it'll be helpful for us this afternoon. Uh, so you have a landowner and they have a 180 acre clear cut. They want it replanted this winter. Um, and their only objective is they want trees. So not many constraints, a pretty flexible landowner objective. So they just want trees. So I want you to work in groups and figure out what type of trees you're planting. So the species and the genetic stock, and there's lists for both pines and hardwoods in the useful handouts packet. So I need the cost per thousand seedlings uh, and the type of seedling you're gonna plant and then figure out what your spacing is gonna be and what your density is gonna be from that. And then tell me how many seedlings you're ordering total, figure out the cost for the seedlings. And so you're figuring all that out. Then what I want you to decide is whether you're gonna hand or machine plant them. And hand planting will be $45 an acre, machine planting will be $80 an acre. And so come up with a cost for that, then add your seedling and planting costs together and that's your total costs for this operation for this land over. So, so 45 bucks an acre hand planting, 80 bucks an acre machine. So any questions on what we're doing? Once you have uh, your answers together, just have one person in your group bring them up and I'll punch them in on a spreadsheet and then we'll be able to look at them up on the screen and compare all your different groups. Okay, uh, so here you can see on the spreadsheet everything you all put in there. Um, and so as we look at this, go over here, so I can highlight some stuff. Uh, hard to see. Okay, there we go. Um, so on the spreadsheet, uh, you can see all the different columns there for all your different options. Um, and so you had a few places where you could control the cost to this landowner. And so if we look, the spacing dictates the density and the density dictates how many trees per the, the job you need to order. And so by the spacing you chose that in part dictated the costs. Um, then the type of seedlings you ordered dictated the costs because there were different costs per thousand seedlings. And then the final place where you could control your cost was hand or machine planting. Uh, where depending on the scenario, you might have preference for one or the other. This was pretty hypothetical. And so the main difference between them for our purposes right here was the cost. And so you all came up with all sorts of different options um, from planting eucalyptus at a nine by eight foot spacing uh, to planting loblolly pine at a six by 14 foot spacing and sort of everything in between. And remember all the landowner wanted was trees. And so if the landowner was looking for a forestry consultant and you all gave them all your different options, uh, as the landowner, if you just wanted trees, would you wanna spend, oh, I don't know, $13,860 establishing this stand on this 180 acre tract? Or would you wanna spend $86,400 to get yourselves trees out there? And with the eucalyptus numbers, that's a low ball because with eucalyptus, you're gonna need a whole lot of herbicide to get that established as well. Uh, it's gonna be challenging to establish. So big differences in cost, right? And so you can control a fair bit of this, especially with this landowner objective that was real vague like this. Um, in the real world, if this is what the landowner said, you could have a conversation with them and say, you know, I can get you trees if we do it this way, you also have the possibility to get timber off it. If we do it this way, wildlife could also be an option out here. So you could have a conversation with them and give them all sorts of different options for their particular stand. But if all they say at the end of the day is, I want trees, go out there, plant them $57 a thousand bare root lob seedlings, go put them on a 15 by 15 foot spacing, which is going to give you fewer than 300 trees per acre, hand plant them and you can get this done for under $10,000 and they'll have trees uh, that they were willing to pay for. So kind of a, you know, maybe not the most common objective, but you get all sorts of different objectives from one another. So, so keep this exercise in mind this afternoon, a, a number of folks forgot the uh, coal seedlings. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be doing something similar this afternoon in lab. Uh, let me go ahead and set the share back up for you uh, for the, Okay. Mm -hmm. 
PowerPoint here. There we go. Okay, and so just as a refresher, this is the same slide that we looked at last class. And so there are our steps. So it looks like you all were pretty good with density and spacing, calculating trees per acre, but a few groups forgot the 10% call. Is that 10% a hard and fast number? Not really. Remember that comes down to the art of silviculture. If you're working with pine seedlings and the nursery is real good, you might end up with 3% or lower. Um, if you're working with hardwood trees that we'll talk about later today, you may want 20, 25% call because you tend to get less uniformity out of those seedlings out of the nursery. And then remember to round up to the nearest thousand. So keep all those steps in mind. Okay, um, so today we're talking about planting trees, uh, but I wanna start with a little brief uh, intro to the direct seeding in case you ever run across that in your career. So can you plant seed? No, what do we do to seed? You sow seed, right? So we've got kind of different terms there. You don't plant seed, you plant seedlings. Uh, you sow seed, but you don't sow seedlings. And so there's kind of some history behind uh, direct seeding in forestry here in the South. So remember, we cut over all the timber in the late 1800s and early 1900s here in East Texas. And then if you think about that period in the 1890s and the early 1900s, uh, we became so worried that we were going to run out of timber as a nation. We became worried about our water quality, that we established the national forests. We established uh, the USDA Forest Service. And at that time, the objective was just, we've cut way too much. We need to get forests back on the ground. Uh, they didn't have a nursery infrastructure. The nurseries didn't exist. The tree improvement programs did not exist. This was before all this. And so your best bet to get forests back on the ground quickly were go to the few forests that you still had out there, collect as much seed as you could from them and go throw that seed out all over the place and try and get new forests established. And so here in East Texas, what we saw um, in the 1930s, lots of people that were farming marginal agricultural lands, you know, the lands weren't very productive to start with. Then you get into the Great Depression where the economy collapses and they ended up not being able to afford the land in many cases. And so um, they couldn't pay the tax bills on it. And so in many cases that got taken by the government and some of that became our national forests and grasslands. And our national forests here in 1930, you know, they've all been cut over. They're all just marginal ag lands basically. And so they need to get trees back out there real quick. So go collect seed, uh, get out an aircraft, you know, disperse seed over broad acreages as quickly as you can just to get trees out in the ground. And so now we have a lot of 80 and 90 year old stands out in our national forests. And if you just broadcast seed across the whole site, is that gonna look like a plantation or like a naturally regenerated stand? It looks like a naturally regenerated stand, right? If you just broadcast the seed uniformly across the whole site. So um, that's been the origin of a lot of our older forests. That was the origin of a lot of the stands that we had on private lands. Those stands are now gone. Right, so we cut out the first forest in the 1800s, and then those stands may have been established in the 10s, 20s, 30s, grew them out on about a 50 year rotation, cut them out, and now you're seeing maybe the third or even fourth forest harvested right now uh, since European settlement. So, so direct seeding was something we used to establish that second forest, but we get much more success and much greater timber yields with planting seedlings and we have a tree improvement infrastructure we talked about last week. We have a nursery infrastructure we talked about last week. And so nowadays we see very little of this being done. Um, that being said, you may have scenarios where this is still something you really want to explore. So if you look at Louisiana right now, they just got hit by two hurricanes in two months. Uh, and so you may have a lot of acreage of timberland that's got significant blowdown on it. Well, areas with blowdown are dangerous to work on, difficult to access. They got a bunch of rain, and so they may not be accessible all winter. And if you know they have an area where it's inaccessible, but it looks like it got completely taken out, and they don't think it was coning much this year. And so our pine seed, only like 0.1% of it will germinate the second year. And so if, it's, if there's not much seed out there this year, they can't count on seed from last year. And so they may need to think about direct seeding aerially. So they could go to a company like Arborgen uh, in that ecology lab, you all went to the seed processing facility, buy seed from a company like that or Louisiana Forest Seed uh, Company. We've bought seed from them that we've used in research projects. 
So buy seed from them, you know, get uh, a pilot and go apply it aerially. And so that, that may be an option in this particular specific scenario. Um, so lots of different pros and cons. Direct seeding is cheaper. Uh, Dr. Bullard, our current provost, did research on this when he was at Mississippi State and found it's two or three times cheaper for oaks to do direct seeding. That being said, direct seeding is not a cure-all. It's like tree planting. It will only work if you do it right. So if you go and throw a bunch of oak seed out on the ground, what's going to happen? Predation. You're going to have a lot of those acorns getting eaten, right? So you need to account for that. So one way to do that is don't try this on small acreages because then you have a lot of edge where small mammals can come in, uh, birds can come in and eat all your seeds. So do this on larger areas. It may help with the rodents and may help with some of the predation. When you plant a seedling, it's already been grown in the nursery for a year. So you're a year ahead. When you sow seed, you know, it's going to have to germinate. And so that builds an extra year in, um, you know, so lot, lots of different pros and cons between the two. Uh, with direct seeding, you have to account for the seed biology, okay? If you collect white oak acorns, you need to get them out on the ground fast because it's difficult to stop them from germinating. If you get seed from other species, it may require cold stratification. It may require a certain number of chilling hours at certain temperatures before it will be ready to germinate. So you've got to account for all that. So you've got, you got to get the timing right. If you go out and you throw seed on the ground in, you know, July when it's 110 degrees out, you're probably not expecting a lot of success off of that. So you need to think all this through just like you would if you plant trees. You could broadcast it across the whole site if you want a stand that looks like it originated from a seed tree, um, or you could apply it in rows or even in spots if you want a stand that looks like it was planted like a pine plantation. And so lots of different options here. Because this is more a historic relic for our second forest, a lot of these photos are probably from the 50s and 60s. And so basically, we've been sowing seed throughout the world for 10,000 plus years, right? It's called agriculture. So what they typically do is they take existing agricultural equipment and they modify it. So here you see a couple small dozers with modified ag equipment to sow seed um, out on these old fields. It looks like they're trying to get reestablished. So, so that's going to apply it as a row. This is a table out of the useful handouts packet, but if you ever need to direct seed Southern Pines, here's some recommendations. And so these companies that sell you seed, they're gonna sell it to you by the pound. They don't sell it to you by the seed. Uh, they'll give you some idea of how many seeds there are per pound, so you can adjust. It'll depend on the seed lot. Some genetics have larger seeds than others. Um, but if you wanna go broadcast it out, you're looking at between 12 and 20,000 seeds per acre that you're trying to broadcast depending on the species of Southern yellow pine that you're looking at planting. So you might be looking at half a pound to three and a half pounds of seed you're dispersing. Or you could go put it out in rows, make a stand that looks more like a plantation where it's just uniformly dropped down a row. Or you could send a crew out by hand and they could put it, you know, 10 seeds out per spot and end up with a stand that looks like a plantation. You probably don't want to put one seed at each spot because they may not germinate and then you'd be wasting growing space. So put a bunch of seeds out, hope one of them wins out quickly and you end up with a stand that looks very similar to a plantation. Of course, doing all this, you've, you've got to worry about predation, so you can use different repellents. Um, most repellents are technically pesticides, and as we'll learn when we get into herbicides, which are also pesticides, all pesticides are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And so if you look at any pesticide, it'll have something on its label that says, it's a violation of federal law to apply this in a manner inconsistent with the label. And so you would have to follow the label with whatever product you use and make sure you follow everything that it says. But here's an example where they used a mouse repellent that worked for longleaf pine. You've got a few different options there. So on the left is an example where they've got a hopper where seed is in one half, repellent's in the other half. And so it's dispersing the seed out in rows and it's also dispersing the repellent along with it. On the right, it's basically just a cement mixer and you can see they're mixing the repellent in with the seed there. So it's coating the seed and then go apply the seed with whatever equipment you're gonna to use to apply it. Um, I've seen equipment like that cement mixer on the right at uh, the IFCO uh, container nursery uh, down in Evans, <coughs> Louisiana. And what they use it for, they use it to dye the pine seed pink because they have to 
take a crew where they're running it down a conveyor belt and they have to have people stick seeds in each of 36 million plugs. <laughs> um, they've got some mechanical equipment that assists with this, but they've got to do that all in a month or two. And so they're dyeing the seeds pink just so they're real visible so they can make sure that everything's being done correctly. Yeah, Will. If you're trying to get a uh, farmer to expand uh, established quickly, why would you just broadcast uh, the grain corn to them this year? So if you're broadcasting seed like this, you're already going with a cheaper option. And so that probably ties into the whole scenario where um, you may not want a discus. So um, if you look at acorns, you know, some of them don't require, you know, necessarily contact with mineral soil. Sometimes you'll see them germinating in the litter layer. So it, it would depend on the, the ecology of the seed there and how it's going to germinate. But if you're already going two to three times cheaper to do this, you probably are going for a cheaper application. So you may not want to then throw in an expensive mechanical site prep treatment. Or you're doing this because it's out in some remote inaccessible area, in which case mechanical site prep is probably not an option. So more typically what you would see done now is if you're gonna be needing to disc and do these other expensive treatments, you're probably gonna go ahead and pay to plant seedlings. So you have that higher chance of success. Yeah. So it sort of all ties together. So um, you're generally not gonna use one really cheap option and then you know everything real fancy. That'd be like having an old beater Buick LeSabre with fancy tires on it or something, right? So it just doesn't make sense. Um, so any, any questions on direct seeding? So that's just a brief intro. If you ever happen to get into it into your career, just, you know, you, you got to look into it a little more to make sure it's successful. Okay, so for the rest of the class, we'll talk about planting, uh, because this is what we're doing operationally pretty much across the board these days. And so, you know, we started developing state nurseries in the 30s in the South. Um, and then a lot of companies like Arbor Gen and IFCO and others have come on board. Um, and we've done tons of research. Uh, there was and is a, a large co-op at Auburn that has done a lot of this research on how to get the nurseries, everything working really well there. And what kind of pine seedling do we want to produce? And so they use a concept called the ideotype, I-D-E-O-T-Y-P-E. And so all an ideotype is, is it's an idealized model of a crop. And so you pick all the traits you want in a crop, you put them all together, that's the ideotype. And so we could do this for corn where you want so many kernels per ear, for example, we can do this for pine. So this is a forest service diagram of the optimum loblolly pine seedling. So it's showing you the loblolly pine ideotype. And so there's a number of different things you can see on here. You want good secondary needles. You want a set winter bud. That's going to be important. If you want to go plant a stand right now, we, we've had enough rain this winter. We have pretty good soil moisture in a lot of er our areas. And so you could think about planting right now. Um, but if you did, if you went to a bare root nursery, the winter buds probably have not set on their seedlings yet. And so that means you would be doing what's called hot planting, where they lift them out of the nursery before the winter bud has set. And it's a risky operation because if you do that, you've got two, three, four days tops to get those seedlings in the ground or they're going to start dying pretty quickly. Um, and so if you have them lifted from the nursery, then your planting crew flakes out on you or it's 100 degrees for a few days because that could still happen in October here. You know, oops, all your trees die. Um, if you wait till they set that dormant winter bud, you can store them at refrigerator temperatures, 38 degrees Fahrenheit for months if needed. And so that gives you a lot more flexibility. So generally hot planting is not recommended unless it was a case where you really had to do it. That's another place, a lot of what we're talking about here is bare root seedlings. That's another place where containers build in more flexibility. You don't think about hot planting containers because the, the soil is right there on the roots in that plug and you don't change that, you plant the whole plug. And so, I'll, you know, Katie has some uh, seedlings in the greenhouse, some container seedlings we just got. So at lab today, I don't think it'll take too long at the end, I'll sort of cycle you through the greenhouse in groups and we can show you what some of these containerized seedlings look like. Um, and so with the containerized seedlings, you worry about a lot less of what we're gonna talk about. So it extends your planting window in both directions and it makes you worry less about the weather on your planting day compared to a bare root seedling. So, uh, so it's just a winter bud there, but there's a lot going on with that, right? You want the caliper or the root collar diameter to be 730 seconds of an inch which is about five millimeters. And that sounds really specific, but I'm gonna show you data on why here in a little bit. 
You want a good root system with lots of uh, lateral roots. You'd like abundant mycorrhiza all over that root system. And then you want a root to shoot ratio where the shoot is two and a half times what the roots are. So a shoot root ratio of two and a half to one. And you'd like this seedling about six inches tall. So lots of research has gone into that. Uh, there's the lava line slash guidelines in the middle, sort of another way to look at everything we just talked about. Shortly, if you get a smaller seedling there on the right, but similar root shoot ratio. Longly, if you get a larger seedling, but look at the shoot root ratio. Now it's one to one. Why is it one to one instead of two and a half to one? What's going to be different about your longleaf pine seedling? Yeah, it's in the grass stage, so it doesn't have a shoot really, right? So it's just a, a bud at the top of uh, the plug. And now th this is for um, bare root longleaf pine, but you really rarely find a nursery that'll sell you bare root longleaf pine anymore. It's almost all planted as containers. Um, so here's, here's your options. About 60 to 70% of the lob and slash pine that's put out there is put out bare root these days. Uh, containers are over 30% and they're a growing market. So uh, containers, again, are gonna cost you an extra 80 to 90 bucks a thousand seedlings, but they give you a lot more flexibility with your planting operation. They give you better survival. Think about the Foshi varietal plantation we looked at back in week two in lab. That was planted right before that really bad 2011 drought, but they had really good survival. Those were containerized seedlings. And so if that had been a bare root stand, I bet you would have had much more substantial mortality in that particular stand. So, so there, there's trade-offs there. Almost all the longleaf going out is containerized. And you know, if you're gonna spend money, you know, two, 300 bucks a thousand on mass control pollinated or varietal seedlings, you may as well spend another 80, 90 bucks a thousand to get those containerized and make sure your really expensive good genetics are a little more likely to survive. So. so I showed you this last class, but that's just the breakdown on those prices for different genetic levels of bare root and container seedlings. So this is similar information you all just looked up in that exercise in the table, right? And we'll use that this afternoon. Okay, so you know when you're gonna be planting, you've gotta decide on a density, just like you all did this morning. That scenario suggested a, a lower density, so it would be cheaper for the landowner because you know they really didn't have a, a timber objective. But if you have a timber objective, you need to know what it is. Um, if I'm planting a stand that is five miles from a pulp mill, I'm gonna plant it at a high density with cheap genetics because I know that at age 12 or 13, if it's an average or slightly above average site, I'll be able to sell pulp wood without having to truck it very far. Uh, hopefully I can time the harvest right. And you may be making a landowner, you know, 300 bucks an acre on a pulp wood thing. Okay. If I'm in an area where it's 150 miles to the nearest pulp mill, I'm planting my stand at a wider spacing and I'm managing it for saw timber, chip and saw and other products I have access to those markets because I may not be able to sell pulpwood trees. Um, if you look up at the Pacific Northwest, they don't really have a pulpwood market anymore. And so they plant a stand, they pre-commercially thin it with brush saws often, and then they clear cut it 35 or 40 years later. So if you don't have a pulpwood market, don't be planting your stand in such a way that you would need a pulpwood thin, right? Um, if you're right by a good sawmill, you're planning at a you know, lower density, probably trying to grow a saw timber sort of stand. Um, we'll talk about flex stands here at the end today, but that gives you an option if you've got access to multiple markets. You know, we talked about the rectangularity of your planting. You know, that's something you can think about more and more. It used to be back in the 50s when we started tree planting, everything was on a square spacing. And everything was on a square spacing because we were worried about branching. And so a square spacing evenly spaces the trees, you get them competing with one another and that causes self pruning and that controls your knots. Well, now we've spent two, three cycles of tree breeding, breeding trees for smaller, flatter branches to minimize knots. And now you can plant them at those more rectangular spacings and the genetics helps you control the branching as well as the spacing. So that's one thing that's allowed us to go to those more rectangular spacings. So think about all these different details in your prescription um, to help inform you on what that spacing is going to be and what that planting density is going to be. And then once you've figured out your density, once you've figured out the genetics of the trees you're planting, you're spending a bunch of money to do this, right? You know, we saw that example on a 180 acre stand, you're spending 10, 20,000 dollars 
um, even for low intensity stand that you're getting established. A lot more if you're planting hardwoods or other trees, right? And so you need to do everything you can to keep these trees alive. Um, so a lot of these recommendations are taken from a forest service guide. You can Google it and find the 50 to 100 page PDF on the website, but it's, it's the uh, guide to the care and planting of Southern pines. And so if you look that up, they focus on keeping these seedlings alive. So you're buying the seedlings alive, you wanna keep them alive. And so everything with how you handle them, how you store them, how you transport them and how you plant them becomes really critical. And so you all are getting a bachelor's degree in forestry. So how many of you plan to be out there planting thousands of trees? That's a really tough job, right? So hopefully what you're gonna be doing is supervising people that are planting thousands of trees. And so supervision is gonna be real critical. So you all need to know how a tree is properly planted so you can supervise planting crews and ensure that they're planting them properly. You want them planted deep, you want them planted early and you want them handled correctly. Um, you never wanna see you know, seedlings going down the road in the back of a truck uncovered with full sun on them and you know, the wind flapping against them at 60 miles an hour, right? That's drying out those roots on bare root seedlings. That's not gonna be a good thing. And so this Forest Service publication has lots of different cartoons in it you can use with planning crews, try and help communicate all this. But here's some of the warning signs, high temps, dry days, low soil moisture, high winds. All those are unfavorable. But again, this, this is bare root seedlings. Container, nurse, container seedlings fix almost all these problems except low soil moisture. You don't want to plant a container tree if you've got really low soil moisture. It'll dry that plug out. Yeah, great. What's that? If you were reckless with them, couldn't you dislodge them from the, the, the plug? The plug somehow? Like no, I'll show you some this afternoon. That's more difficult to do okay. than you would think. Yeah. Um, the plugs are uh, peat brought in from Canada. So it's organic matter. So it's all tightly bound together. And then it's full of the roots from your seedlings. So that, that's much harder to do than you would think. Okay, so for bare root seedlings, you have normal, marginal, and critical planting conditions. The perfect weather to go plant your trees would be if it was 38 degrees Fahrenheit, completely overcast with a light drizzling rain and high soil moisture with no freeze in the forecast. So uh, I don't think a lot of you would probably like to be out there then planting, but the trees would be very happy. Um, but if you look at ideal planting conditions or even these normal planting conditions, in an average February in East Texas, we may have eight days that meet all those criteria. And so we have warm winters. We know in the middle of January, we could get above 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we know in the winter around here, while our humidity in the, most of the year is often very high, uh, we know we get periods in January, February where you know, relative humidity could be 17%, 30%. It could be pretty low. And so you know, you, you've got to watch all this. That's another advantage of container seedlings. You're not worried about most of this except soil moisture with the container seedlings. The intent here is to keep your roots from drying out. So you want 33 to 75 degree days, but you would much rather be in the lower end of that range. Uh, you want relative humidity greater than 50%, winds less than 10 miles an hour, and soil moisture at 75 to 100% of field capacity. Marginal conditions you can see are warmer, lower humidity, higher winds, lower soil moisture. And then our critical conditions are if it's freezing, and so if you start buying seedlings from Arborgen, for example, they'll start emailing you freeze warning in effect, you know, don't plant trees this weekend. And so they'll start trying to give you a heads up on that. Um, if it's real hot, you don't want to plant them. They'll respire too much. They chew through their own sugar too much if you get them hot and that leaves them weaker, less able to grow roots. So you have to keep in mind they're alive, they're respiring. Um, high winds or really low soil moisture. We have a lot of Octobers around here where we just flat out do not have the soil moisture to plant trees. So you might be able to plant them from a temperature standpoint, but if you don't have the soil moisture, it's not gonna happen. Okay, on normal days, keep the roots wet, but you don't want the seedlings sitting with their roots in standing water in a bucket or something, that would drown them. Um, have the planters keep the seedlings in their planting bags. You don't want this to see them out, you know, holding 20 seedlings in each hand because those root systems are drying out out in the air. Uh, you want them separating seedlings carefully and quickly. Uh, the last thing you really wanna see is a planting crew where everybody has a machete, okay? Um, because if they're out there and you have 20 different hand planters and they're all root pruning, you gotta keep in mind how the planters are incentivized. The planters are often paid per seedling they get in the ground. And so they're incentivized to plant very quickly. 
But what you care about as a forester and what the landowner cares about is what are the chance those trees you're paying for today can become a dominant tree in that stand. And so you need them planted right. And so what you ideally wanna see is no root pruning out in the field. If you do end up with a batch of seedlings where the root systems are just too long and you think you do need to prune them, you want one or two people doing that right by the truck so it's consistent. Um, they can also be going through the trees and throwing the cull seedlings out then. And so you get a better, more consistent cull on the trees that shouldn't be planted. So that may be something you need to do operationally. Um, you can control some of this with supervision, with post planting inspections and with how you set up the contract. So your contract may have some sort of escrow account where the, you know, some of the money they're gonna get paid gets set aside and the forester goes out there afterwards and they dig up you know, a certain number of seedlings to sample them. And they look for J rooting that we'll talk about in a minute where you know, the tree wasn't planted deep enough. They you know, try to tug the seedling out of the ground with a couple needles and if it pops right out, it wasn't planted well. So they look for issues with the planting. Are they getting the spacing right? Are the trees planted deep enough? All this. And if it doesn't meet the specifications laid out in the contract, there could be a financial penalty. So that incentivizes the person running the hand or machine planting crew to make sure it's done right, as well as done efficiently and quickly. So uh, lots of things you got to keep in mind with the planting crews, but you, you want to make sure that they're treating the seedlings well, not carrying more than a two hour supply out there. Marginal days, all this becomes even more important. Um, on marginal days, you don't want them having the seedlings out of the bag for you know, more than a minute or two. Uh, you don't want them carrying more than an hour supply. Ideally, those seedlings would back, be back at a central area on your job where you have a refrigerated truck that's storing them. You know, you may not be able to afford that. So you may just have them in a central area under a tarp, in the shade, out of the wind, maybe occasionally hitting them with a hose from a water truck or something just to keep them wet. You don't want to plant on dry ridges. And if you have a freeze coming up in the next few days, you know, you don't want to see all your trees killed. So you need to suspend planting if you can. That can be difficult because the planting crew may be telling you we're here this week and then we're gone. Uh, we will not be back. So that's, again, if you're real worried about that and, you know, you don't like that risk, that may be worth spending a little extra money for those container seedlings because then you're not as worried about all this. Critical days, you know, don't plant at all if you can avoid it, unless it has been freezing, but it's warming up from the freeze and doesn't look like it's going to freeze again, then you're probably okay to go planting. Uh, th this is all for Southern Pine in the Southern US. If you go to different parts of the world, it's a completely different thought process. Um, so I, I was talking to someone from Canada and they were talking about planting white spruce. And what they found out is they get better survival if they plant in August than if they plant in July, which is not what we think about here at all. If we plant trees in July and August, they're dead within a day, okay? So that, that's never something we're gonna do. But they're basically the trees they planted in July got too big and got snow damage in their first winter. And so the trees planted in August were a little smaller, a little more flexible, better able to handle snow loading in that first winter. Um, if you go a little further south from Canada into northern hardwoods, you know, you're planting after everything thaws out in the winter. So you're planting in like April, which would be way too late to plant in the south. So depending on where you go in the world, that's going to dictate when you can actually do your tree planting. So. Um, if we look out in Arizona, this is a picture I took out on a planting. They had had about 500,000 acres burn in a large fire, and they were trying to reestablish some trees out there, get the stocking back up. And so they said, we planted trees here. Y'all go take a look. And so I went out with a group of a few other people that we were all from the south, and we're looking around like, anyone see where they planted these rows of trees? Like, none of us could find them. And then we realized they weren't just planting rows of trees. They were found finding down burned logs like this. They were finding rocks. They were finding little raised hummocks of soil. And they were only planting these containerized seedlings on the lee side of these objects. So they were planting them in these little sheltered micro sites. Because if they just planted them out in a row and just planted them out on a flattish open spot, that tree's dead, even though it's a container seedling in these, you know, 7,000 foot elevation spot in Arizona. It just gets too dry and then too hot in the summer. So there, they were hoping with their container seedlings for a 25 to 30% survival. That would be a success for that operation, which is nuts from a Southern perspective. That would be a failure by any definition around here. We're looking for 85 to 90% survival uh, with our planting operations here in the South. So lots of different regional differences between planting and what you consider a success when you do it and how you go about doing it. So looking at Southern pine, plant them deep. 
deeper than the nursery for a bare root seedling and they will be fine, okay? Try to make sure the green end is up, but other than that, get them in there deep and they're gonna be in good shape. Um, you can plant half the top and they'll be fine. They'll be perfectly happy with that. Um, I'll show you more on J-rooting in a moment, but J-rooting is where the root curls up. And the root curls up because the planter didn't dig a deep enough hole and because they didn't create a deep enough hole when they stuck the seedling down in there, the roots hit the bottom of the hole and just packed in there. And so you need a deep enough hole in order to plant the seedlings deep or you'll get into J-rooting. Um, when you pack in the roots, I'll show you how we do this this afternoon. We'll demonstrate it. You want good contact between the soil and the roots. You don't want air pockets. So you generally create a furrow with your planting bar and then you close it from the bottom to the top to get any air pockets out. Um, if you have air pockets, those roots will dry out and that tree will die. And so that's what you're trying to avoid. Um, you want the roots packed tightly. So again, you can pull on a couple needles with a couple fingers and the tree doesn't pop right out of the ground. You don't wanna you know, use your full strength on it and crush the tree though. Uh, you wanna keep it alive. Here's the importance of planting deep. Four centimeters is just less than two inches. Plant them two inches deeper than the nursery, almost complete survival. Same depth as the nursery, still good, 90% survival. If you plant them less than two inches shallow, you get half of them dying, okay? If you have roots coming out of that planting hole, that's a path for desiccation and that tree's not gonna be in good shape. So uh, make sure you do not plant them shallow. So when we talk about J rooting, you know, this may be hard to see, uh, especially with how bright it is in the classroom right now. Uh, but this is a table showing you studies from 1954 to 1998 with longleaf slash and loblolly pine. And the column on the left here is gonna be the percent survival of trees they dug up that had straight roots. And then they looked at the next column, which is percent survival on trees with bent roots. And then they have a root form column. So back in the 50s, they called it U rooting. Uh, then in the 70s, they started calling it L and J rooting, curl rooting. And then this one study in 92 got real fancy and called it Psi rooting, a Greek letter. Um, but the important thing is that column on the right, the difference in survival between the straight rooted and the J rooted seedlings. And it's 0, 0, 6, 7, negative 15, negative 2, negative 12. Uh, the study in 63 had problems, question mark, question mark. Negative three, seven, zero, two, eight, negative four, two, five, two, negative seven, four. So across all those numbers, what seems to be the rough mean or the rough median? What's the number in the middle of all of those? So you've got some small positive numbers. You've got some small negative numbers. It's about zero. So there's not a ton of difference in survival attributable to J-rooting. So J-rooting happens because the tree is planted shallow. So it's a symptom of a shallow planting. It's not in and of itself gonna necessarily be an issue because those roots are real plastic. They'll grow wherever they can grow in the soil. And so this is data where the y-axis is showing you percent survival and the x-axis is showing you root depth with uh, deeper plantings to the right, shallower plantings to the left. And we see a really strong correlation whether it's well watered on top or water stressed on bottom between rooting depth and seedling survival. And they looked at J-rooted versus I-rooted seedlings and they found that the J-rooted seedlings didn't survive as well, but it was because they were shallower. And so they ended up shallower. And what happens is summer goes on and the soil dries out, seedlings draw more water from greater depth. But if they're not planted at that depth, they can't draw that water and then drought ends up killing them. So J-rooting is a symptom of a shallow planting and a shallow planting can cause you drought mortality in the summer, so. Okay, kind of hard to see this figure in this classroom, uh, the way it's set up, but if we look at it, what's going on here, um, I told you that 5.5, 5, 5 millimeters, 732nd of an inch, root cal caliper was gonna be really important. So here's some data that shows you why. So if we look at this figure right here, okay, that's gonna be about five millimeters. So larger trees to the right, smaller trees to the left. This is about 80% survival right here, 100% survival right here. And so once you get above about five millimeter seedlings, survival is 80% and up. Below five millimeter diameter seedlings, survival is gonna be pretty poor. Well, let's look at this even further. You don't have to worry about the units on the y-axis, it's cubic decimeters, um, but that's tree volume. At age five, 
versus root collar diameter as a seedling when it was planted. A millimeter is not much, it's very small, okay? But that seedling that has one extra millimeter on its root collar, if you look at any difference here between three and four, four and five, five and six, it makes a big difference in the tree volume. So the, the three millimeter root collar seedlings were about three cubic decimeters. The six millimeter were about six. And so that very slight difference in the size of your seedling can double your tree volume at age five. Here's another study where they planted four millimeter root caliper seedlings and five and a half millimeter root caliper seedlings across four sites. And they looked at two year old tree volume. Again, major differences. And the differences are exacerbated even further on the lower quality sites where growth is less. So it makes a huge difference. Um, you have to think of a tree. You put a sn small snowball at the top of a hill and roll it downhill and it gets larger and larger and larger, right? There's that weird commercial on TV right now with the lady rolling through town, picking up blankets and turf and all sorts of stuff. Same sort of idea with a tree where if it starts a little bigger, it has more sugar stored in the stem and the roots. It can grow more roots, which allows it in that first growing season to grow more leaf area, which lets it photosynthesize more. And it just goes on and on and on. That seedling always stays ahead of the seedling that was smaller. And so it doesn't sound like a big difference, but root collar diameter is really important. The nurseries know this. The nurseries are trying to sell you good trees that are going to survive well and grow well. But if you ever go buy seedlings from some new nursery or something like that, you know, I, I would take a caliper with me, measure the root collar diameters. And if they're, you know, three, four millimeters on a lava light pine root seedling, I wouldn't try planting that um, because of all this data that you've seen today. You want it five millimeters or larger. Okay, planting date makes a big difference. Here's some rain ear data from Georgia. Lava olive pine planted in October and November. Two years later, two growing seasons later, is at 1.3 meters in height. That's DBH height in metric, okay? 1.37 meters would be four and a half feet. Uh, but in Europe, they actually use 1.3 meters even. So it, you know, jukes their stats a little. They're measuring slightly lower, so their trees seem slightly larger. Um, but, you know, those trees you planted in October and November have a DBH after two growing seasons. The trees planted in February and March, some of them are half the height. So the earlier you can plant them, the more they can grow a root system that first winter, the better survival, survival will be in the next summer and the better growth will be in the next summer. And it just, again, it keeps on snowballing throughout that rotation. And so plant them early if you can. Of course, if you're working for a company and they're planting 8,000 acres, you can't plant all 8,000 acres necessarily in November. In October around here, you might not have adequate soil moisture. We already talked about that. If you ha have to plant late, if you have to plant in March, that's where around here, you're really starting to think we need container seedlings. Um, you're not gonna be wanting to put bare root trees in the ground in March if you can avoid it in any way. And for those who don't like graphs, trees planted in November, trees planted in March. So there's the clear difference between just a few months different in planting. So that was a lot on bare root pine, uh, but let's look at hardwood too. So you'll plant bare root hardwoods often. Uh, it's much less common to get containerized hardwoods. And so with the bare root hardwoods, remember these are deciduous species. They just look like sticks. So you better be good at IDing twigs, right, from dendro, because you don't want to mix up which species your trees are. So you got to know your persimmon buds, right? You may want bigger seedlings for hardwoods. You may want them to have a 3 8 inch root collar diameter. You may want them 18 to 24 inches tall. For some species, one year in a nursery bed will not accomplish that size. So you may need 2-0 stock. So it's a matter of working with the nursery to get them to grow out the, the trees that you want that are going to do well. If you have a bigger seedling and a bigger root system, you need to adjust your planting equipment. The photo on the bottom left, uh, the top is a pine dibble, bottom is a hardwood dibble. So you may need a larger dibble to get the root system planted properly so it doesn't J root, so it's not shallow, so you'll have good survival. You could use a planting shovel, which is just a shovel with more plates welded on it so it doesn't break after you plant your 500th tree. Um, we were just up in the Ozarks with the Forest Service. Um, and they were talking about planting oaks up there and uh, they actually use a two person power auger and dig a hole to plant their oak seedlings in. So they've got tough rocky soils up in the mountains and that was getting them the survival that they needed. 
Uh, of course, they were saying every time they hit a rock, you would know because the two people on the auger would go flying in opposite directions. So uh, not the easiest job, but again, we talked about this. You may not need a 10% cull. You may need a 20% cull on your hardwoods. That photo on the bottom left shows a fork tree that never should have been planted. Top right, if it comes out of the nursery bed and it's already J-rooted like that, it's never going to root at depth, right? So don't put that tree in the ground. You're wasting all your money on this whole operation if you're just putting trees in the ground that are going to die or that aren't going to meet your final product specs. With hardwoods now, we're often talking about a mixed stain. So that builds complexity into this. Uh, if you want to manage for timber, you could put a row of bald cypress, a row of green ash, you know, uh, a row of, you know, sugar maple, you know, whatever your species are, you could plant a row of each of them and that works well operationally, okay? Uh, if you're managing for aesthetics or wildlife, that may not work at all, right? You know, that would look kind of odd. You don't see normal hardwood stands looking like that. But here's the problem. If you just tell the planting crew, go plant my trees at random. Well, remember your hand planters are getting paid per tree they put in the ground. They know they can put small trees in the ground faster and they're easier to carry and easier to plant than large trees. So the first person of the pile of seedlings you have out for them grabs all the pecan because they're smaller than your oaks. And they go and they go plant all the pecan trees you've got in this one corner of the property. And then the oaks get planted in this other corner and it doesn't work out like what you had hoped. Um, so an example for what Luminant does uh, out on their mines, if they know they want 400 trees an acre and they know it's gonna be 50 white oaks and 25 water oaks and you know 30 nut all oaks, they know what their mix of trees is from what they've been able to order. Um, they take the time and they have the foresters and some other folks go through all the trees. They're able to do the call right there. So they get a good consistent call and they count them out and they mix them in bags where there's 400 trees per bag in those exact proportions. And so you hand the planter a bag and say, go plant this and they're all mixed together. So they're going to be all mixed together. It'll look more like a natural stand. And they can look in their cooler and they say, we've got 15 bags left, which means they know they have 15 acres worth of seedlings left. So it's real handy from that respect as well. So. <coughs> Hardwood seedlings are more expensive uh, and you've got that higher cull percent and you don't have as much information on the genetics, uh, the provenance, any of that. So a um, little more complexity there with hardwood. We're seeing hardwoods planted out on reclaimed mines. Lots of people planting hardwoods for wildlife. A few people planting hardwoods for timber production, cherry bark oak, um, sweet gum for pulpwood when pulp prices spike. So we're seeing people planting hardwoods. Um, the big companies really aren't doing any hardwood planting at all. So. Okay, um, in the last 10 minutes of class, I, I want to sort of combine those concepts with something that you may not have heard about. Um, this is a concept that a bunch of different folks have come up with. Uh, originally, it was called a flex stand and then Arborgen trademark flex stands. So now other people are calling these mixed genetic stands or coming up with other terms for them, multi-use stands. But here's the idea. It's all a pine plantation. So this is all loblolly pine, but we know we can buy all these different genotypes of loblolly pine now. And the cheap ones may be 57 bucks, a thousand bare root loblolly pine OP. The expensive ones might be $420, a thousand containerized varietals, okay? You don't want to spend 42 cents on a tree and then harvest it at age 13 for pulpwood. Okay. One of the big barriers to the expensive genetics is how do you afford planting them at establishment? So what they've started doing is saying, why don't we mix these different genotypes of loblaw? So in this example, what they did is they took their expensive MCP or varietals and they went out and they planted them on a 10 by 20 foot spacing. And then in between the 20 feet between the rows, they went in and they planted the $57 a thousand bare root trees at a three or five foot spacing, you know, and again, every 20 feet apart. And so now the idea is you can come back here at age 12, 13, 14 for your first then, you can take out all those cheap trees. So you planted them for pulpwood, okay? So you take them out, so it's a second row thin. And what you've done then is you've left about 225 or so good quality genetic trees, varietals or MCP for saw timber for your second thin and end of the rotation. So you're not wasting money on the best genetics for pulpwood trees removed in a first thin. So the landowner might make 300 bucks, a thousand, 300 bucks an acre on you know a first thin here. So they make money on this. 
those trees that you planted out there, they kept the varietals growing real well, helped them self prune and everything that you're looking for there. Um, and so it all works together. The downside to this is what if the logger comes back in and second row thins the wrong rows, right? <laughs> or that was a nice grid on a sheet of paper, but you all saw the HGT track, right? Where they planted along the contour and you were trying to put in those plots and hey, my row disappeared. You know, in the real world, this gets more complicated. You have to be able to figure out for sure 10 or 20 years later, which trees are which. So you need a way to do that. When ArborGen has been doing this, or sorry, not ArborGen, Warehouser has been tinkering with this over in Louisiana. And what they've been doing is they've been planning out cheap tree, cheap tree, expensive tree, cheap tree, cheap tree, expensive tree, all within a row. And so it'll be OP, OP, MCP, OP, OP, MCP. And so how do you keep track of that? Well, what they do just south of each MCP expensive tree they're planting, they're putting two OP trees in one hole. So their hope is they'll be able to go out there at about the time of the first thin and say, cut out all the fork trees. Because <laughs> the fork trees are just double planted OP trees. And so they cut all them out and they know they're hopefully leaving all the MCP trees out there. Hopefully you can just do it by size. Hopefully the genetics, the best genetics were the best genetics. Those are your biggest trees. Just leave the biggest, best looking trees and you'll be fine there. But what if you have a varietal out and you pick that varietal, not because it grows a lot better than your OP trees, but because it has significantly higher specific gravity. It's got better wood properties. Then you can't see that, you gotta figure something out. It's hard to tag a seedling and have that tag still be there 15 or 20 years later. Um, you could stick rebar in the ground and hope you can find it with a metal detector. But the other thing is a lot of these companies are selling the lander every 10 or 15 years. So if they're gonna be turning the land over that frequently, then it's gonna be a different company, maybe the same Forester, but a different company figuring this out later. So figuring out how to do it is more complex than you would think. And then there's another wrinkle we have to start thinking about. Um, and so this is this idea of idiotypes, again, the idealized model of a crop. Those are two different six-year-old loblolly pines we cut down as part of my PhD work at Virginia Tech. And we dragged them to the top of this hill so we could photograph them with that plain blue sky in the background so I could analyze the canopy area with the photo. Um, and so what you see here, those two trees had very similar stem volume, but look at the differences in the crowns. And so here's some data from a study where we went out on some ArborGen sites, four sites spread across the south from Bogalusa, Louisiana on over to Somerville, South Carolina. And on each site, there were about 200 different clones planted out. So we took all sorts of different measurements on them, measured about 4,000 trees over about 10 days. Um, and what we did, you know, we measured DBH, we measured height with a height pole. And those numbers, you can think of that as the percent that's under genetic control. 63% and 67% of DBH and height. We're controlled by genetics in these clones. That, that's good, that's what you want. But when we eyeballed them, we just eyeballed them. Is it a narrow crown, a wide crown, or a crown in the middle? Is it a really dense crown, a really sparse crown, or is it average? And so when we eyeballed them, that was under genetic control 70 to 74% of the time, even more than size. Uh, so that was kind of surprising, but this is what that allows you to do. The size of this circle is related to stem volume. So those bigger circles have bigger stem volumes. So there's your 200 clones, a dot for each. Look at the large circle in the bottom left. That's a picture of that tree maybe, where it has that really sparse, really narrow crown. Look at the picture in the top right, that has a big circle and that's a tree that has a really wide and really dense crown, but they may be producing very similar stem volume. And so some other work, work some folks have been doing, they, they've called trees on the top right a competitor idiotype, because imagine that tree growing with other trees. It's gonna shade them out, it's gonna get a wide crown, it's, you know, it's gonna compete with them. Versus the tree on the bottom left, they've called that a crop idiotype. You can plant a lot of those per acre, they won't, compete too intensely with one another, and it'll grow you a nice crop tree. But here's some data from some different slash pine families. Uh, this research was done out of Florida, Tim Martin. Um, and what they found is when you start mixing these genetic entries together, like in a flex stand, it may not work out quite how you think. So S1, that slash pine family, that turned out to be a crop idiotype, that narrow little tree. And so when you planted a mixed stand, that light gray bar on the left, it didn't grow as well because it was mixed in with some competitor types and they outcompeted it. When you planted it just the pure stand of family S1 with that crop idiotype, it grew better. So it did better just planted by itself. 
So if you throw that into a flex stand, it may not work out the way you hope. It may get out competed by those cheap pulpwood trees, right? So, um, and then if you look at family S2 there, that was a competitor idiotype um, where when you mix them with crop idiotypes, they did better, that light gray bar on the left. But when you plant a pure stand of all that competitor idiotype, they compete with each other and they don't do as well. So, so there's still more we've got to figure out ecologically and operationally on these flex stands. You know, maybe there'll be something we see wider deployment of, uh, maybe not. Uh, we'll sort of see how it goes. So, uh, but there's the idea of even within a pine plantation, we have this mixture of genetics now and we can start doing things we never used to think about. So, any questions on tree planting? <laughs>